Hello, everybody, and welcome on this bright, beautiful morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, today, we are hosting Dr. Charlotte Dean, um, and we have worked with her for many, many years um, following her work using precision cut lung slices uh, in respiratory research. So a little bit about Dr. Dean. Um, she leads a research group at Imperial College London's National Heart and Lung Institute, and she specializes in lung development and repair. This is particularly important given that we had a COVID pandemic recently. Um, her group's mission is to leverage the similarities between lung development and disease to gain insights into lung disease pathobiology and pioneer innovative regenerative and repair strategies. Their research explores the potential of regenerative biology to restore damaged lungs, particularly in cases where repair is hindered by genetic mutations or repeated exposure to pollutants or smoking. So Dr. Dean's work centers on alveolar biology and involves the development of cutting edge tools, including using precision cut lung slices to advance the study of postnatal lung development and mechanisms of repair, which will be discussed in her webinar today. Um, so I'm very excited um, to welcome you, Dr. Dean. Um, so with that, I wanna hand it over to you. And for all of those who are now attending and coming inside, I just want to say again, if you have questions, please use the chat box, and then you will also have a moment um, and a chance to ask it in person at the end of Dr. Dean's talk. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. So um, what I'm going to try and do today is to uh, focus on some of the tools that we've developed over the last few years um, of working with lung slices. Um, and hopefully these will illustrate the versatility of um, not just lung slices, but more broadly tissue slices um, for use in um, research. So uh, let me just, there we go. Uh, so in terms of um, our general aim in the group, um, uh, as Abby just touched on, we're really working towards the ultimate uh, goal of finding uh, regenerative medicine treatments for lung diseases. Um, and we take a broad approach, not focusing on any particular disease, but um, as many of you will know, there's obviously quite a significant burden of lung disease. Um, and that involves both adult lung diseases, which have uh, dysregulated repair, so things like emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but also um, we're interested in being able to uh, regenerate the lungs um, with a view to uh, helping restore um, insufficient alveolar growth. So diseases due to um, anomalies in development where, for example, in bronco bronchopulmonary dysplasia, you don't generate sufficient alveoli. And this can leave you <clears throat> with a lifelong susceptibility to um, further uh, disease, lung disease. So, um, you will probably be well aware now that the lungs, although they are not um, rapidly turned over like some other tissues, skin, for example, or gut, and they do have a quite significant uh, regenerative capacity. Um, and this is um, reproduced um, a, an image from a, a paper by Butler et al. from 2012, which was a real sort of seminal paper where they um, took CT scans of this patient who'd undergone a pneumonectomy uh, 15 years apart. And they could show that compared to the um, first CT on the left, 15 years later um, on the second CT, there was significant new growth of the lungs. So human lungs have extensive capacity for repair. And this is uh, somewhat of an old diagram now, but um, uh, again, you'll be no doubt aware that there are a number of different populations in the lungs that sit at various different positions, whether it's airway or alveoli, that have uh, stem or progenitor potential. Um, and more and more information is being added to this knowledge um, all of the time. So there are a number of different populations that have the capacity to act as stem cells or progenitors to help drive um, regeneration and repair. 
Um, and this is a, a, just a, a more recent uh, uh, diagram from a review from 2022 by Chan et al., uh, which I think very nicely illustrates some of the specifics, a bit more of the cell biology um, and starting to dig down into particular different cell types of how we understand lung repair and regeneration proceeds in the alveolar region of the lungs. Um, so in particular, um, I wanted to use this diagram to illustrate that we know that these alveolar type 2 cells, these sort of cuboidal cells, um, have a significant role in lung repair and regeneration. Um, and we know some of the sort of steps um, that are involved. Um, but what I want to point out, because it will become relevant later in the talk, is that some of the key um, proteins that we can use to mark uh, uh, regenerative aspects in the alveolar region are to label proliferating cells with KI67 and to also label these um, AT2, uh, progen these progenitor cells or activated AT2 cells with a protein uh, called prosfactant protein C. So I'll come back to this a little bit later. So what we really wanted to be able to do is to really decipher the cell biology and the signaling mechanisms driving intrinsic lung repair. Um, and from my point of view, because we know that there are very many parallels between the signals that drive lung development and those that can also drive lung repair, that's the emphasis um, that we have in our lab. So um, can we interrogate those factors that we know are important for lung development? And can we see what their role is in repair? And may those factors be uh, you know, possible to be used um, uh, to sort of enhance um, regeneration and repair um, in the lungs to treat disease? So over the years and still now, of course, there are very many different tools and methods that you can use to uh, try to understand methods and mechanisms of repair. And some of those um, I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with. So, for example, scratch assays are a simple cell based model um, that we can use um, to look at uh, repair. Um, how well does the scratch get healed? And you can modify your gene of interest or your protein of interest in the assays. And then you can ask questions about whether that has an effect on repair. You can also uh, do um, studies where you can take uh, tissue from um, sort of donor or healthy donor and uh, disease patients. And you can compare the levels of certain genes that you're interested in. Uh, by qPCR, and you can see whether they're altered. Um, and of course, you can use um, in vivo whole animal models uh, where you induce an injury and then um, look at defined time points at the ensuing repair. And then you can also take sort of broader approaches like a population-based approach. So you can take population studies. This is one we did some while ago looking at a gene we've done a lot of work on called Vangel2, and we could show that, um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but basically if you had a, a, a single nucleotide polymorphism in this gene and you were a smoker, that you had a significant loss of your um, FBC in terms of the lung volume. Um, and so there was an interaction between this SNP and smoking. Um, which meant that you were more vulnerable to lung damage um, than those who did not have this SNP. So this was uh, done using a birth cohort of adults that were all the same age, but there are obviously other very many different um, population cohorts. So all of these things are fine, but what we were lacking was a model that really allowed us to see what was going on. So the lungs obviously are very difficult to access. They're deep within the body. It's hard to image them. Um, and so this is where, you know, the, the tissue slices have really come into their own. So I'm going to tell you about three models that we've developed over the last few years. And uh, I appreciate this is a little bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, the models are all published, and obviously, I'm very happy to ask any, uh, you know, answer any other questions. But um, I hope I'll give you a sort of bit of an introduction to each of these models, 
Um, and then obviously, you know, you, you you feel free to ask anything more that, that you want to. So the first model was really uh, one that we established to enable us to um, have a platform that would let us look at the cell biology of lung repair and would let us address whether our factors of interest that we wanted to um, work with would have an effect on repair. So um, this is the sort of strategy of the acid injury and repair model. So of course, uh, central to this is to create your, um, your tissue slices. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the way that this works, but in the lungs, just as a reminder, you need to uh, fill the lungs with agarose um, because you need to retain them um, as an inflated organ. Um, and so you have to instill them with agarose before you then surround them with agros to uh, put on the holder and then place on the um, precisionary instruments uh, lung slice or tissue slicer. So the, the thing that we did uh, really with this model is to actually in a very crude manner, so just using a cloning cylinder, but isolate off one region of a slice um, that was then protected from the surrounding area so that we could apply an injury just to that area, so a spatially restricted injury. Um, in our case, we used acid. We wanted something that was very reproducible and easy to manipulate. This is actually a clinically relevant driver because gastric acid aspiration is actually a key um, sort of mediator of lung injury in human patients. Um, but you can imagine that this um, type of situation could be used um, with other types of injurious agents. So um, what you have after you've um, instilled your injury, you just add the acid for a minute, you then wash it away and you remove the cloning cylinder. And what you get left with um, is what you can see in panel C. So if you look at low magnification, you can see uh, the whole tissue slice now, and these are labeled for live and dead cells. Um, and you can see that um, towards the tip of the lobe, um, you have many pink cells, which are the dead cells. And then um, in the other area, of which we didn't injure, um, you can see mostly live cells, um, because of course you haven't induced an injury. So if you um, look at different magnifications, you can really get down to a cellular resolution. This is obviously, you know, because we're using the lung slices. Um, um, what I will point out is that even within the area that's been injured, you do retain some live cells, but you do have a lot of uh, dead cells as well, um, just uh, after the injury. So what's nice about this model is that you can, it's scalable. So um, you can obviously obtain many slices from one um, animal or one piece of tissue if you're doing this with human tissue. Um, and so, you know, you can then uh, test all your different drugs or treatments and you can see that you can get a lot of information um, in a relatively short space of time. So um, some of the other features of this acid injury and repair model um, that are really uh, nice are that you can uh, modify the severity of the injury. So we did a sort of um, dose uh, response where we used uh, lower and lower acid concentrations. And then we looked at um, you know, the effect on how many live and dead cells you would get. Um, in the injured region. So this bottom four images here shows the injured region. And you can see that as you lower the dose of acid, you get more and more yellow live cells, as you would expect. And then you can do other assays to make, make sure that you have good viability of your tissue. So uh, metabolic type assays like MTT, or there are other variations um, just to show that, you know, for example, at our most uh, highest uh, concentration of acid, we get quite a lot of um, cell death or loss of metabolism. Whereas when we tighter down to the lower concentrations, then you uh, lose much less, um, many fewer cells. So you can actually uh, have a sort of a severe injury and a, and a mild injury, and that's quite useful, again, for studies. 
OK, so how do we read out what's going on in terms of this model? How do we actually assess the extent of injury and repair? So what we did was um, we split, uh, we, we immunostain our PCLS after culturing them for 48 hours. And we have done lots of different time periods. I'm going to focus on 48 hours today. The maximum we really go uh, out to routinely is about 96 hours. After that, we de do see a drop off in viability. Uh, but our, our sort of usual time point is 48 hours. So uh, what we do is we assess uh, the different two different regions um, uh, of the lung slice. So the uninjured region, which is shown in the top here, and then the acid injured region at the bottom. And this goes back to one of those markers of, of repair and regeneration that I talked about, which is pro-SPC. So this is a marker of progenitor cells, if you remember, the activated 82 cells. Um, in the alveolar region of the lungs. And what we uh, showed was that, um, you know, we have 82 cells in the sort of uninjured region. You can probably just make out in the yellow. And the, here's the quantification here. Um, but what was interesting was that if we looked at the injured region of the tissue, and you can see that in the graph most clearly, we saw a significant increase in the percentage of progenitor cells or activated 82 cells um, that were induced uh, following our injury. Um, and as I say, in our two different acid um, concentrations, you can see that we get those different levels. So we still see an increase with the mild injury, but it's less, uh, it's not um, as significant as it is with the, with the severe injury. So, uh, the progenitor cell population um, is um, induced upon acid injury, and we can monitor that as one of our readouts of uh, repair and regeneration. We also looked um, um, at another marker of progenitor cells that's been used for a number of studies in the lungs, and there are others um, that, that different publications have used as well. Um, uh, but that this marker is called TM4SF1. It's a cell surface marker. Um, and we got very good overlap between the uh, yellow SPC cells and the sort of pink TM4SF1 cells. This is with co-staining here. Um, and we just showed that sort of somewhere in the region of 80% are co-staining uh, for both those markers. So this was just another way to show um, that we were picking up the progenitor population that is being increased um, upon injury. Um, so the other marker I mentioned at the beginning is to look at proliferation. And as many of you will know, then, you know, proliferation has a role in um, regeneration and repair. So we wanted to look at um, pr proliferation on, in our injured and uninjured region. Um, and this is where we, we, we found some unexpected cell biology. Um, so in, in this case, when we looked at proliferation, um, when we compared slices that we hadn't done anything to with the uninjured region of our acid injury um, uh, treated slices, there was a significant increase in proliferation in the uninjured region. Um, but interestingly, we saw almost no proliferation in the acid injured region. So I, I told you we see an increase in the pro-SPC, but that population, at least at this time point, is not co-localized with, um, uh, with pro-SPC. Um, we have done some uh, other studies looking at what populations of cells are um, expressing um, or are uh, proliferating. And it's a bit of a mix of cells, I have to say, but the real take home um, in this case is that unexpectedly you see uh, increased proliferation in the adjacent healthy uninjured tissue, but not in the injured region itself at this point in time. All right, so that's the sort of basics of the acid injury and repair model. So um, just to sort of show you a little bit about what kinds of things you can do, some sort of real data. 
Um, some of you will know my lab's been very interested for a long time in, in wind signaling and the wind plane of cell polarity pathway. So a lot of the data I'll show you is, is, is related to that pathway. So what we wanted to do was look at alterations um, in this wind um, planar cell polarity axis, and in particular in, in the sort of wind 5A um, and wind manipulation um, area, because there's a lot of interest in this area as a potential target for um, modifying disease. Um, so we used our acid injury and repair model, and this time we treated some of the air injured models with WIND 5A, and some we kept just in media alone. And without going through all the details, the, the point I want to uh, focus you on is in the injured region, uh, where we treat the slices with WIND 5A, we see an additional increase um, in the percentage of SPC uh, positive cells, which is over and above the increase we see anyway. But wind 5 a really augments the, um, the sort of uh, increase in, in progenitor cells um, in the injured region. And if we do um, um, an alternative experiment where we say what happens if we, if we knock down or if we um, inhibit WINTS in our acid injury and repair model, what effect does that have? Um, you can see that in the right-hand graph. And again, just focusing you on what we see in the injured region, uh, we used a WINT inhibitor. This is uh, actually a pan-WINT inhibitor, so it's not selective for WINT 5A. It inhibits secretion of all WINTS. Um, and when we uh, look here, we see um, a, a, a significant decrease in the level of those pro-SPC cells, um, sort of back down more to uh, the kind of control level. So you can see that um, more broadly that using this model, you can sort of interrogate, interrogate mechanisms of repair and injury um, and look at the cell biology quite in quite a lot of detail. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I want to say about the AIR model is just to uh, show you that this um, can be uh, also done using human uh, precision cut lung sizes. So this is looking at the pro-SPC population using the AIR model, um, but now this is with human tissue slices. Um, and you can see again, both in these uh, last two images uh, showing the injured region and also in this graph, um, that you also see the increase in the pro-SPC cells in the injured region. So it's translatable um, directly to a human um, slice model. Okay, um, the other thing I'm going to just finish on in terms of talking about this model is it's not just um, the uh, sort of cells themselves, and obviously I focused on epithelial cells, um, but there are lots of other parts of uh, lung biology that you can look at in the slices. Um, I won't go into this in detail for interests of time, but for example, we can show changes in the um, amount of uh, collagen um, in the ECM. Um, and, you know, we can look at other cell populations as well in our um, air model within the tissue slices. So it's really versatile, depending on what aspect of lung biology or um, tissue biology you want, you want to follow. Okay, so that was a whistle-stop tour of the AIR model. I'm going to go on to the second model um, that we've developed using um, precision cut lung slices. And this is um, looking at biology in the developing lungs now, um, looking at early postnatal uh, mouse lung development. So um, just to highlight that in this case, actually using mouse uh, is, a, is a really useful model to study alveolar biology and alveolar formation or alveolar genesis as it's called. Um, and that is because mostly alveolar genesis occurs postnatally in the mice. And of course it's easier to access the lungs to obtain tissue and then make uh, lung slices. So um, uh, for that reason, for this project, uh, we used uh, mouse precision cut lung slices. 
So the sort of major understanding of how alveoli form is that, um, you know, you have after you have these sort of relatively um, immature saccules that form, um, you then get subdivision um, from this, uh, which is how you form uh, alveoli. So you get septation that subdivide uh, more and more the sort of air spaces and this is how you increase your surface area and you get um, sufficient surface area to support respiration. Um, so this is the sort of major understanding or has been of how alveoli form. But again, the problem has been that it was really difficult to actually understand what was going on in real time. And a lot of the work was done by a lot of sort of clever different ways of trying to sort of uh, take sections and then perhaps recombine them or, or other sort of different techniques. But it's, it's, it's challenging to do this in um, sort of sections of tissue to really understand what's going on. So we were really excited when this paper came out by Peretti et al, which had taken uh, PCLS um, from early postnatal mouse slices, and they'd done a really careful um, comparison study to show that if you uh, took the PCLS um, and cultured them um, and compared them to the development stages of lungs that were freshly taken out of uh, mice at the same uh, relevant um, same ages, um, you could show that alveolar genesis would actually continue to occur in the PCLS ex vivo. So, you know, again, showing the versatility of the tissue slice uh, model. Um, so because of that, we thought that we would see if we could actually image alveolar genesis using time-lapse imaging. Um, and this is the sort of basic setup and others have again taken this on and, and done more uh, perhaps slightly even more sophisticated um, uh, model setups, but this is our sort of basic uh, way of setting it up, uh, which is that we essentially just immobilize the slices uh, by gently having a sort of a, a filter um, that just allows the tissue uh, slice to remain immobilized uh, with a very light weight on top of it, just so you don't get any movement. And our, in our case, we do our imaging using a wide field uh, microscope. So the reason for that is that we need to do quite long-term time-lapse imaging over a number of hours, um, and we wanted to minimize photo bleaching. So we uh, took the um, decision to use the strategy of, of imaging with a wide field microscope. But uh, on the left-hand side, you can see um, what the images look like when you do this. And you can see they're quite blurry because you're looking through obviously a 300 micrometer slice. So in order to kind of clean up the images and get rid of the out of focus light, we then um, run the film through uh, the movies through deconvolution software. And the other thing I should say is that we can label um, different cells or, or different regions of cells using um, fluorescently conjugated antibodies. So in the movies I'm going to show you, uh, we have uh, labeled uh, the epithelial cells with EPCAM and all of the cell nuclei in the PCLS just with a, a SIR DNA. Um, so uh, in terms of what, happens. Um, I'll just play this movie. Hopefully you can see uh, the cells moving. Um, and we spent lots of hours looking at these movies and um, on trying to get our heads around understanding the cell behavior and the sort of general things that we were seeing. And we came to a number of conclusions. One of them is that you can see septation events in these kinds of cultures. So you can see A1, A2 uh, in the top left of this um, movie here. And this is where um, epithelial cell is coming across and subdividing what was a single airspace um, into two airspaces. But interestingly, apart from showing that the cells were really quite dynamic, and this is um, a movie sort of filmed over about 12 to, to 14 hours, about 12 hours, this one, 
we notice other behaviors that we're really interesting. Um, for example, in these blue circled regions here, we could see uh, cells moving together and clustering um, and forming sort of quite tight uh, balls of epithelial cells, if you like. And then over on the right hand side here in this A5 region, we could also see where there was an existing airspace um, that you would have sort of uh, epithelial green cells that would come and move into um, uh, integrate where there were already existing epithelial cells and they were sort of like shoring up the walls of, of uh, an alveolus, if you like. So um, I'll stop that movie and move on. So um, again, I'm just skimming over a lot of this, but what we did from a lot of careful analysis and tracking um, in this uh, paper and this study was that we could uh, show these different behaviors that were repeated in um, over and over again in lots of different PCLS. Um, and we showed that you, uh, we hypothesized that you had this uh, sort of uh, formation of alveoli from different steps First being that you have the cell clustering happening, and then uh, you would get a hollowing where the cells would then move apart again and form a hole in the middle, which was an airspace. Um, and then the airspace would open up, more cells would come in, and you get the sort of mature um, alveolus, at the end of which you can then get more subdivision by septation. So this is just to show you again some of the biology um, that you can uh, do using these uh, lung uh, PCLS movies. Um, so these are movies where we um, either just had um, the, the slices in control media or we had the slices in media containing cytochalasin D, which as you probably know, inhibits um, actin polymerization. And so generally restricts cell movement. Um, and this was just a sort of a good way of us showing that um, we could actually see changes. You can probably see that um, the movement definitely looks different in the slices with the cytochalasin D to um, on the left hand side. Um, and just to say, we did a lot of um, analysis. This is some of the readouts you can get with um, cell tracking, for example. Um, you can plot um, net migration, um, and we also carefully check that we weren't just killing everything. So essentially, um, what you can see probably most clearly from these uh, cell tracing graphs is that um, if you have uh, an inhibitor of, of the actin cytoskeleton there, as you would expect, you inhibit cell movement. So this is just a, a proof that, you know, you can use this model to um, add drugs or, or manipulate the system and then follow what the cell biology is. Um, and uh, the last uh, movie I just want to show is just to highlight that um, it's not only the epithelium that you can look at. And um, depending on which um, markers you choose to use, the red here um, is PCAM, so you can look at the uh, vasculature as well, or, or you can pick other different populations. Um, and the other thing you can do is you can look at, uh, you can make PCLS from uh, mouse mutants, and you can look at differences in biology um, and really understand what the impact of a mutation is in terms of the cell biology and lung development. So I won't go into all the details of this for, for interests of time, but um, you can read more about that. Okay, so just in the last um, five minutes, um, I will just uh, talk through the third um, um, tool um, and method that we've set up. This is much more recent. Um, it was published um, at the end of last year in Disease Models and Mechanisms. And this is um, what I think is a really um, exciting use of tissue slices. And I think, you know, this is obviously potentially viable beyond lung slices um, to other um, tissue slices as well. And this is a method that we developed for being able to modify uh, flock salials ex vivo in precision cut lung slices. So this is uh, not having to do anything in vivo. This is not having to use Cree driver mouse lines. This is a way of uh, re recombining flox deletes, 
um, completely ex vivo in precision cut lung slices. Um, and this is the sort of, uh, you know, uh, steps basically involved. So we call this the, the TREATS method, um, and that stands for TAT recombinased allele modification in tissue slices, so TREATS. Um, and these are the, the basic steps um, that you take. So you have your flox to mouse line, whichever, you know, whatever you're interested in, and you generate tissue slices um, obtained from your flox to mouse. You then add a cell permeant free recombinase. Um, so this is essentially uh, a pre recombinase where there's a, a TAT um, protein transduction domain and a nuclear localization sequence. And this has been engineered to make it cell permeant. So it's just a liquid that you add into the media. So it's simple as anything. Um, and then um, you culture the slices um, um, using sort of steps that we uh, worked out. Um, and then you can obviously analyze to ensure that you have had, got recombination. Um, and that may be by a variety of methods, you know, microscopy, qPCR, et cetera. So I'll just show you uh, some of the data of, uh, that we got. So this is the first um, mouse mutant we used. And in this one, um, we wanted recombination to switch on a reporter gene in the PCLS. So this is, uh, you know, once we had recombination, um, we would switch on this EYFP, um, but without recombination, no uh, EYFP would be expressed. And you can see um, in these images here, these are um, images of PCLS. And in the top one, uh, this is where we've added the cell permeant CRE. And you can clearly see you have lots of um, YFP. Whereas in the untreated control, there's no YFP at all. And you can validate this. So you can, you can show a massive increase in the uh, YFP uh, once you've induced um, the CRE recombination. Um, and then the second approach that we used was to delete um, a gene of interest. And this is back to um, the Vangel 2 that I mentioned we worked on quite a lot. So here we have LOX-P sites flanking a critical exon, um, which means that after CRE recombination, you delete your gene of interest. Um, and again, we could show that we'd massively reduced um, the uh, gene of interest after we've done the CRE recombination. And we validated this um, using different readouts um, according to what we know happens uh, when we have defects or deficits in this angle 2 gene. So we've worked before on a, a, a mouse mutant, um, which has a, a, a single base pair change that gives you a dysfunctional um, uh, Vangel 2. And if you compare the phalloidin f actin uh, labeling in the bottom picture with what you get in wild type, you can see that there are differences. Um, so we know that this gene is involved in actin remodeling. But really interestingly, when we um, did our um, uh, TAP CRE in uh, the Vangel 2 Floxed PCLS, we got an even more severe uh, phenotype where we massively saw um, reduced and uh, changes in the organization of the actin cytoskeleton. So the, the Vangel 2 loop tells not a complete deletion, um, it results in dysfunction. Whereas here we've obviously, uh, you know, we've knocked out, you know, both copies of um, the Vangel 2. So uh, that's the end of the whistle stop tour. Um, and I'll just uh, finish by um, thanking very much all of the people who've done the work that I've talked about today. Um, so uh, the people whose names are in blue are those who've uh, done the bulk of the work and um, uh, on the different models that I presented to you. And obviously uh, with help from many different collaborators over the years and funding from uh, various places as well. So I'll stop there and very happy to take any questions. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Dean. And as I'm looking at the acknowledgements that you are um, showing, I recognize some of the names personally over the years, um, like Dr. Melanie Kernix-Hoff, Dr. Mark Griffith, 
And we are very excited about Dr. Sally Kim because of her publications, including the results um, that you showed us. So we have a couple of questions already, and I want to open up the floor and have Dr. Osman Ponche, um, who also uses precision cut lung slices. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, Dr. Osman Ponche, please feel free to and ask your question. If not, I am happy to also. Do you want me to stop sharing as well, Abby? Uh, no, you can definitely um, keep okay. sharing. I will have, um, well, in the interest of time, if you don't mind, Dr. Ponche. Yes. Oh, here she is. There she is. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, is uh, um, could you please elaborate on the role of lung fibroblast in uh, lung repair, uh, if there is any, any role of fibroblast uh, in this uh, mechanism. And uh, the second one uh, is a technical question uh, regarding uh, QPTR uh, experiments. Uh, uh, what uh, housekeeping gene are you using? Because in our uh, experience, uh, we um, we met uh, some uh, changes uh, in the expression of uh, GAPDH uh, uh, expression uh, in human uh, PCI. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in terms of fibroblasts, yes, they definitely do have an important role in repair. Um, <clears throat> we've done a little bit of work labeling the fibroblasts and initially we found it quite difficult to get a really good um, uh, marker to label the fibroblasts really well in the PCLS for us to do imaging work with them. Um, but we have a Vimentin-based uh, label now, which is a, a biotracker, Vimentin biotracker that labels the fibroblasts quite well. We haven't gone down in more depth to subtypes of fibroblasts. Um, but um, there's definitely a sort of a interaction between the epithelial cells and the fibroblasts and probably with the surrounding, you know, ECM and other components as well that all work together to drive repair. So um, although we've done a little bit, we haven't yet published anything on the fibroblast side, but they definitely are important. Um, and, you know, you can sort of, our feeling is that the, the models have then opened up possibilities of looking at lots of different things and lots of different aspects of uh, repair and things. And um, we kind of, um, but, you know, we, we, we sort of started with the epithelium, if you like, and, and there's many, many more things that can be looked at, I think. Um, with in terms of the housekeeping genes, you're absolutely right. We've also had um, similar issues. Um, uh, you will find we have published some accompanying methods papers to some of our sort of original uh, papers that, that I mentioned in the talk. Um, B2M is one of the um, housekeeping genes we've used that works quite well for us in human lung, um, which is relatively stable. Um, and then there's another one which I'm trying to think about, and I can't think of it off the top of my head. So GAPDH we do sometimes use, but we do find that that fluctuates a bit. Um, uh, so B2M is the main one we've used in human, um, but I think there might well be um some others that we that might be mentioned in some of our methodology papers or i can certainly you know uh let you know more if you if you want to email me yeah okay thank you very much thank wonderful you. um dr um naira cardines also said fantastic talk thank you uh, she asked if you could potentially post the reference for the cream method so maybe dr dean i'll reach out to you and i um and uh, Dr. Cardines, if you want to reach out to me, I will put you guys in touch for sharing that reference. Um, Dr. Deskin, Brian Deskin, if you want to unmute and ask your question. He has a great question that I'm also wondering about as well. <laughs> hey, uh, Dr. Dean, I like your talk. Thank you very much. My question, uh, I'll just read it verbatim. In my experience, generating human PCLS is much more difficult than mouse PCLS. 
primarily from difficulties with inflating human lungs with Averos. Do you have any tips you could offer when working with human PCLS? Yeah, it is challenging. And um, uh, where I am, we usually get, we don't get whole lobes, whole intact lobes of human lung. We get small pieces that have come from lung resection. So um, they don't have, they're not um, encased in a pleura, you know, some of it's open. Um, so the main thing that we use is um, a method, which I think Darcy Wagner developed actually, where um, she creates an artificial pleura and it's pretty, it's fairly straightforward to do. And that's the really key thing. So you initially you seal the portion of lung that you have with the artificial pleura. And then um, we just use a point injection method to sort of go around the piece of tissue. It is quite hit and miss. Uh, we don't, you know, we spent time trying to sort of aim for where we could see small airways and try and inflate that way and things like that. And in the end, we just sort of go evenly around the tissue as much as we can and inject bits of agarose. Um, and what you sometimes find is that a part of the tissue inflates really well and a part of the tissue doesn't. And with the humans, with the human lung, we use a, a tissue cora to then go into the tissue and take a plug of tissue out. So if we've got a region that's inflated well and one that hasn't, of course, we take the core from the well inflated region. But, you know, it's it is much more challenging. Sometimes we get pieces of tissue and we have, we almost get no slices. Other times it inflates beautifully. Um, there are, I think, um, so Melanie Konigshoff's lab has done a lot of very nice work um, uh, using human tissue slices um, and Darcy as well. And there is quite a lot of um, methodology available. Um, we haven't actually, we've published relatively little um, using the human slices to date, but we're definitely using them more. And so we're, we're planning to publish a lot more with human slices. But if you have, I don't know, specific like small questions and things like that, I'm very happy if you want to get in touch. Thank you. Um, could you repeat the, the one reference, Darcy? Yeah, so Darcy Wagner, so um, she's listed on my collaborators there. So she's now at Lund University. Okay. Um, and she was in, in Melanie's uh, lab for a while, and then and, and she's had her own lab for quite some time. Um, and, and, you know, they've really pioneered a lot of the work, um, among others. I mean, there's many. It's always hard to you know, make sure you you um, acknowledge everybody. But but, you know, I think you if you looked at some of their references and Darcy particularly did the artificial plura. So, OK, thank you very much. Cool. And then before we go on to the next question, we have one more. Um, I just wanted to also say. Um, um, for uh, in our experience for PCLS, if you're cutting from human uh, or mouse, especially um, human um, uh, lung lobes. If you get a whole resected lobe, you have a lot of core tissue. Um, you want to get a lot of slices because they are quite precious coming from human. And so we actually have um, developed and just launched this year a high throughput vibratome for making those sections. It's called the Compressome VF 800Z. It's the only type of vibratome for high throughput lung sectioning on the market. And um, just to explain how it works is you have multiple, you can have a whole lung lobe if it fits, it's a 10 centimeter diameter. Or um, what our scientists have done is they've taken, you know, dozens of lobe cores um, or multiple mouse uh, uh, lung lobes embedded in one sheet. And with one, each single cut, you can have basically a uh, PCLS uh, um, for a whole well plate. So they're able to collect hundreds of tissue uh, slices for their research without wasting, you know, a precious organ or a sample. Um, and then to give you a sense of what that actually looks like, here is um, an image from of actual uh, multiple embedded mouse uh, lungs um, in the VF800Z. 
And um, this is from um, one of our collaborators at Novartis who used this large high throughput vibratome. So if you're interested, definitely reach out to me too at Precisionary. We can give you a quote and we provide uh, free demos um, of this large um, vibratome. And so with each cut, she's collecting hundreds of um, sections. Um, and it's great because um, she, um, for this particular respiratory researcher, the samples are quite precious and she didn't wanna waste any. Um, with that, we have one more question, um, I believe from Dr. Bernowden. Is it Bernowden? I'm not sure. But if you want to unmute yourself. Hi Dr. there. Dr. Yes, quite good. Dr. Dean, thank you for your soon, uh, very nice talk. My question is, you, you've showed us very nice results in static conditions. Mm. But in the lung, there is a sinusoidal mechanical stimulation with inspiration and expiration. Have you tried? to have your 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 sex, your sections your long sections in such in a, in such conditions yeah so you're right that um sort of uh, cyclic stretching um yes. is very important um in the lungs we know obviously we're breathing all the time and and that's what happens in reality um, so in, I, I have to say that in the models that I've shown you, we have done just with static conditions. Um, but um, we, we have in the past um, used um, a flex cell machine to sort of immobilize the slices and stretch them, you know, cyclic stretching um, and then read out biology, you know, different, um, do different assays and things after stretching. Um, so you can do that. Obviously, if you're going to try and image them, that's very challenging because, you know, it's very challenging if the tissue samples moving. Um, but there are labs who focus more on adding in that aspect of lung biology. And there's a few um, labs that have done, um, uh, you've taken uh, precision cut lung slices and published work where they've done cyclic stretching using either their own system that they've um, made, uh, built themselves or using the flex cell model. Um, so you can do it. Um, it is possible. It works very well with tissue slices, with lung slices. Um, but what we haven't focused on doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your talk. Wonderful. Well, with that, I think I'll wrap it up uh, in the interest of time. Um, Dr. Dean, this is one of the best uh, webinars we've had. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for all of our attendees. If you have um, any questions about references, please reach out to um, us at Precisionary Instruments, uh, either at abby at precisionary.com or info at precisionary.com. And I can put you in touch with Dr. Dean. If you're interested in our high throughput vibratome in a demo, let me know as well. With that, thank you again and everybody enjoy the rest of your week.